All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you Hello. so much for joining us. Um, so I wanted to start off um, with a quick two-minute meditation um, that I will guide you all through. Um, so get very comfortable, feel relaxed. If you want to lay down, sit up, um, sit very comfortable. Um, so the purpose of this meditation, um, we feel that it is needed. It is a radical act of self-love or just of love just to sit down and to be quiet for a time by yourself. And um, now more than ever, we need to remember um, this ancient wisdom and the daily rituals of our foremothers who have prepared us um, for a time such as this. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So in a, in a dignified sitting posture, um, or whatever you prefer, whatever you're most comfortable, as you feel ready, and you can close your eyes or you can have them open, but um, as you feel ready, bringing your awareness to your breath and the body as a whole, breathing and resting here for a period of time, establishing a relatively stable platform of moment to moment awareness, riding on the waves of each breath. Breathe in and out. And when you feel comfortable resting with the flowing of your breathing in this way, picturing your mind's eye to whatever degree you find it possible, someone in your life who loves you or who loved you unconditionally, evoking and giving yourself over to feeling the qualities of the selfless love and kindness they accord you or accorded you in the whole aura or field of their love for you. Right here, right now, breathing with these feelings, bathing in them, resting in the warmth and radiance of their heartfelt embracing of you just as you are, or drinking in the experience that you unequivocally and unconditionally loved and accepted as you are without having to be different, without having to be worthy of their love, without having to be particularly deserving. In fact, you may not feel particularly worthy or deserving, but that does not matter. It is in fact irrelevant. The relevant fact is that you were or are loved. Their love is for you, just as you are, for who you are now, already and perhaps always have been allowing your own heart to bask in these feelings, to be cradled in them and trained into them, to be rocked moment by moment in the swinging rhythmic beating of the loving heart of another. And in the cadences of your own breathing, allowing your heart to be held and bathed in this way by the warmth of this radiant pulsing field of loving kindness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have people on here with us from all over the world um, tuned into our Conscious Conversations live stream, um, which is hosted by Healthscape Life Sciences LLC. Um, and for those of you who do not know, Healthscape Life Sciences is an early stage healthcare and health equity consulting firm founded by Dr. Helene Clayton Jeter, who is on here with us and who is also my mother. Um, after many of years as working as a doctor in the private sector and the public sector, she decided to create her own lane in the health equity field. Um, I am proud to be a daughter of a woman who has taught me how to speak life, um, which brings us here today. Um, because we are women who we never meant, we were never meant to survive in this world. It was not built for us but we have blazed through anyway, um, which is why we are here today to share their stories and our stories and to aspire, inspire a revolution for the total healing and liberation of our people. 
because um, we are the daughters of artists, activists, storytellers, singers, powerful women, and we are in need of healing. And our intention with this space today is to bring that health and well-being to the forefront for Black women. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to introduce you all to, um, we have some phenomenal um, women panelists here with us today. Um, we have Dr. Daryl Cumber dance um, You want to say hi, Dr. Dance? Um, hi. Hello. She is best known for her um, work in Black anthology and folklore. Um, she is a former faculty member of the University of Richmond in Virginia, as well as Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, she will give us a rundown on her, our historical use of humor as a survival tactic and its importance today, as well as the fact that laughter is so critical to physical and psychological and emotional health needed for survival, especially for Black women. And she is the author of Shucket and Jivin, Folklore from Contemporary Black Americans, um, and Honey Hush, an anthology of African American women's humor, just to name a few. Um, Dr. Dance's work is widely praised and is an impressive collection of our stories, as well as an affirmation of um, our life, strength, and triumph. Um, I think her work is groundbreaking and is a testament to the wit and wisdom of contemporary Black women and is a treasure, it's a, just a treasure trove of traditional Black folklore. Um, and she recently co-authored The Lineage of Abraham with her daughter, Daryl Lynn Dance, who is also here with us. Um, and you can check out her work on Amazon. I'm gonna drop a link into the chat right now for you all to see. Um, yeah. Yes, and so we also have, like I said, Daryl Lynn Dance. Um, She's also phenomenal. She's a graduate of Hampton University, Virginia Commonwealth University, um, and the University of Kansas. And she has taught writing, um, technical writing and literature courses at the University of Kansas, um, as well as at Virginia Commonwealth University, Marquette University, and Hampton University. Um, and she is bringing her knowledge today um, in music and in African-American literature and how the two can help us heal. And then finally, Dr. Helene Clayton Jeter, founder and CEO of Healthscape Life Sciences, LLC. will bring her 30 plus years of experience in the medical field. Um, she's gonna talk about health disparities and social determinants of health within the black community and its relation, relationship with health, stress and self image. And all of you will bring your voice, opinions and questions as we collectively learn and heal and share self care survival secrets passed down from generations. Um, so I'm just going to go over the rules and the format of the live stream today. It's going to be about an hour to an hour, 15 minutes. Um, we're just opening. We still have some people joining with us now. Um, and then I'm going to swing it on over to Helene, who's going to do the discussion and, um, and chat with the panelists, um, Dr. Dance and Daryl Lynn, um, for about 30 minutes. And then the last 30 minutes will be questions and answers. And um, feel free to put your questions and answers um, into the chat at any time. I will be monitoring them throughout the conversation. Um, but we're going to wait and do the questions and answers for the last 30 minutes of the live stream. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? No? All right. So are you ready for me to kick off the discussion? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to start uh, the discussion with uh, something that I learned from a Girl Trek campaign webinar uh, about a month ago. And I thought it'd be a good way for us to open up and to kind of connect our heritage. And so that, uh, so we, the panelists will kind of go ahead and, and do the Daughters Of. And this Daughters Of really is the inspiration to today's conversations. I, I found it, uh, it was very, very fulfilling for me to be on the Girls Track uh, webinar and I will start. So basically- Before down, just, just before, just in case nobody knows what Girl Track is, it's okay, a yeah. nonprofit organization of thousands of black women across the country who walk and organize to reclaim their health and to inspire their daughters to take back the streets of our communities. Um, just to give a little background so you all know. <laughs> now we know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am Helene Denise Clayton Jeter, daughter of Helen 
Wilkins, Clayton Brown, daughter of Mary Virginia Clement Wilkins. And next I will go to, and I will refer to the doctor dances um, by their first names. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Ms. Dance, because this is what I know her as. So Ms. Dance, uh, I would like you to do your daughter of, and then Daryl Lynn, uh, you can go next. I am Daryl Veronica Cumber Dance, daughter of Sally Veronica Bell Cumber, daughter of Sally Corona Brown Bell Brown. All right, you go, Daryl Lynn. I am Daryl Lynn Dance, daughter of Daryl Veronica Cumber Dance, daughter of Sally Veronica Bell Cumber. I was gonna say first name is probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you all wanna share your, your daughters of in the chat or you can speak, you can speak it now into the video. Um, but um, Sierra? All right, did I start with my name? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Sierra, daughter of Helene, daughter of Helen, and daughter of Virgie. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? All right, so let's go. So today we have several um, topics that we'll discuss, and I thought it would be uh, easy for me and I'll be, you know, uh, facilitating the discussion and I thought that would be easier for us to start with some foundational science because that's what I bring to the discussion and then we'll move on from that. So the first question for the three of us, um, for Daryl Lynn, Daryl Cumber and Helene is what is the role and impact of cumulative stressors including stress, sense of self, diseases, your zip code, etc on the black community, specifically black women. What are some ways that we can combat these cumulative stressors and heal as a community? So I will start and um, then the dancers can pick up uh, after that and they will talk about self-image, the psychological impact from a historical perspective. And of course, I'll talk about health and health disparities. So I wanted to start out with stress. Stress is a killer, period, point blank. But guess what? Stress is very, very difficult to measure in a clinical study because there are so many different variables that go into stress that it's very hard for us to measure that clinically, even though we know it's, its impact. But what we do know is that stress affects your blood pressure, your cardiovascular system, it affects um, so many different organs in the body. And I wanted to go over a little bit about um, some statistics basically um, involving um, stress. So the first statistic I wanted to go over was looking at mental health. And as we know, mental health uh, goes hand in hand with, with every diseases. It crosses diabetes, hypertension, uh, every disease. Uh, there is some mental health component, especially of chronic diseases. Um, so when we look at mental health um, and chronic diseases that disproportionately affect Black people, we know that 1.3 million women and 835,000 men are victims of physical violence by an intimate partner annually. Domestic violence and abuse doesn't discriminate, um, it, irregardless of your, your race, your gender, your age sexual orientation or your economic status. It doesn't discriminate. This is very similar to health disparities. For health disparities in the Heckler Report back in 1985 showed that uh, African Americans or Blacks at the time, because they did the study looking at Blacks, Whites, Asians, those were the, the categories. Um, and Blacks at the time, regardless of your social economic status, received inferior health care, period. So I wanted to tie in health disparities from that standpoint when it, came, when it comes to uh, health care, 
it doesn't discriminate, and neither does mental illness. And I know that the dancers can pick up on some of the psychological points now, and we can kind of bounce back, because I have some other statistics I want to bring into the discussion. But, but Ms. Dance or Dura Lynn, is there something you want to add to the discussion about the psychological um, effects of, um, of um, stress on the Black community? Well, I teach and um, I, I work with students who are under a lot of stress. And I know that, that um, the stress impacts academics, it impacts um, how they see themselves in terms of um, their own self-esteem. So sometimes I work with students who see themselves as perfectionists and they're coming into an environment, especially freshman students are coming into an environment um, in which they're discovering that, um, that they're, they're not as, as perfect as they were in high school. Yeah. And so that affects them a lot. And one of the things that I talk to them about is making sure that they see themselves as a human being and not as a grade. So if they come into my office and they say, well, I'm an A student, I say, no, 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 you're a student, right? You're not an A student, a B student, a C student, you're a student, you're not a grade. And I think that's very important for college students to understand I see, I see, I see. Um, there's a, a tie in with healthcare as well, because um, me as a clinician, um, I really push when I'm speaking for speakers to identify patients as patients and not as the disease. And an example of that is when doctors talk among themselves or among other colleagues, they have a tendency, oh, I'm going to see this diabetic patient, I'm going to see uh, this uh, hypertensive patient, this heart rhythm patient. No, the words and the language, the lexicon should be, I'm going to see the patient who has diabetes. I'm going to see the patient. So I think, Daryl Lynn, you're right. So you're teaching your students. I'm actually teaching my colleagues. Uh, basically, you know, there is a, a, a more perfect lexicon when we're addressing people and individuals. So I thought that was a great point. Yeah. Looking at our history in this country, if I may come in now, it seems obviously that we as black women deal with a society where stresses are designed actually to destroy us. Um, and I think our goal needs to be to find ways to deal with these stresses. And I think in this society, healing starts with family, friends, community. I think any healthy black woman, female, girl, adult has survived in this nation because she has found some kind of supportive refuge uh, where she can gather at least for momentary relief community with supportive it friends. Um, and this is what has saved us through our history. Our history is full of accounts of a refuge <clears throat> where black women gathered for some momentary group interaction and laughter that helped them find support and reprieve and sanctuary and even armor to go back out into the world. Slave women gathered in their slave quarters in an enclave in the woods, even, believe it or not, on the slave block and the whipping tree among fellow women, they found reprieve. Jailed women in their cells at night, day workers working in kitchens and other people's homes get together. Even today, we see the mothers of the slain black boys gather together at yet another funeral. As college professors, we gathered together and offered support to each other. Last week during a TV program featuring the black female mayors of Atlanta, Chicago, San Francisco, and DC, 
the mayor of Atlanta mentioned that they frequently reached out to each other. Mm -hmm. And I saw a knowing smile from the other women. Mm -hmm. Black women in high places, no matter how high, are still first and foremost Black women. And believe me, they are besieged on all sides. And believe me, even they in those privileged positions need friends to chat with, to talk with, to complain about, to share their pain, and uh, to scream their anguish, <laughs> uh, to talk about the things that they have to face in their positions. Wow, wow. So talking about that screaming and that anger, um, we probably need to do more of that because according to statistics, um, one in three adult women and, and when, we, when we use the word women, it's as defined genetically with the two X chromosomes. Um, and that refers to reproductive anatomy. That's the only way they can, can do that in studies. So uh, in studies and in science, when we talk about women, it's the double X, okay? So that one in three are people with the, the double X chromosome uh, will be, adult women will, um, will have uh, heart disease. And of course, heart disease is the number one killer of all people, but it's also the number one killer of women. And, and if we look at media and advocacy, we would think that breast cancer was the number one killer. And so that's where that education comes into play because heart disease, especially in women, uh, postmenopausal women, our risk goes up just as high. And when I say our black women risk is just as high as the white male postmenopausally. They don't really know why, you know, there are not a lot of studies as to why, just like there are not a lot of studies about menopause or the change itself, uh, which I'm wondering why not, but uh, that's another story for another day, another conversation. Uh, but um, so our chance of getting, of having, of dying of a heart attack postmenopausally is the same as a white male. So we need to do more things to reduce our stress. Um, and of course, you know, we always see in the medical references, diet and exercise. And what does that really mean? Um, there is no prescription that we're given for uh, the best diet for you individually or the best exercise. Can exercise be cleaning up your house, planning, can exercise be doing a number of movements versus getting all gussy up and going to the gym and making sure everything looks good. Uh, so I, I'm diverging a little bit, but I'm talking about hypertension, cardiovascular disease and its impact on women. And I wanted to give another uh, statistics um, uh, including talking about heart attacks. So heart attacks is seen about 10 years after menopause uh, is much higher, like I said, with, with, with women. And, and what are some of the other things that go up with age? High blood pressure, triglycerides, uh, LDL, which are the bad cholesterol, um, whereas our HDL or good cholesterol goes down. Uh, this is really just talking about women and you know, so therefore, we say around the age of, of 54 or so, where most women go through menopause, uh, our chances of getting out of the 50s alive is a lot lower. And this is something that we don't hear a lot of discussions about as far as, as health and how it disproportionately affects Black women. Uh, now let's talk about just diseases foundationally. Um, despite uh, a lot of improvements in technology, uh, we still are not getting the best care. And when I say we, I talk about women generally, but then when we go down another level to black women, the studies that I've read is abysmal. And I can give you one study um, that they did on uh, going into the ER, women that come in with symptoms, even symptoms that are recognized. And we probably have heard that some of our symptoms of heart attacks are different than men. It could be a pain in your jaw, your shoulder, your back, nausea. But no, we're talking about the symptoms that a man would give, clutching his heart, um, shortness of breath, uh, all of those kinds of things. The women, there were zero women given the opportunities. The doctors would not put stents in these women. It was zero. Where they looked at men and white men, of course, the study was comparing 
um, you know, all races and looking at black men next to black women, we it was a zero for black women. Um, black men was like five or some 5%. It is ridiculous. So we still today, today, um, treatment of our symptoms. Uh, they still feel like women, it's in our head. And there's some psychological reason for us feeling like we're having a heart attack or the flutter in our chest. Um, that is still going on today. And I don't know if uh, Ms. Dance or Daryl Lynn um, is something that you want to add to the health aspect uh, historically uh, from that standpoint, or we can move on to the next question. I would certainly like to talk a little bit about the importance of humor mm -hmm. to okay, so uh, let's health. Go. How can we learn from stories from the past in order to heal in the present? I think that's a good a next question. Let's talk about that. How can we learn from stories in the past in order to heal or either to have improved health? Like let I me ask you, first of all, if you would let me say a little something about something you raised earlier about okay. the need for exercise and that sort of thing. And laughter, laughter is one of the most important exercises we can have. Proverbs teaches us, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Wow. 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said, you must laugh 10 times during the day and be cheerful. Otherwise your stomach, the father of affliction, will disturb you in the night. So whether we go to the Bible, whether we go to Nietzsche, whether we go to medicine, laughter is one of our answers. Laughter jumpstarts the immune system by releasing endorphins and activating T cells. Laughter relieves stress, lowers blood pressure, helps control pain, changes moods, develops a sense of empowerment, builds morale. Laughter is really one of the ways that we have survived and overcome some of these issues. I mean, we find instances of people who even insist that with all sorts of illnesses, they started reading a funny book, watching a funny series, and they found that laughter certainly offers some relief from some of the problems that they have. So um, I, just, I just wanted to say a little something while you were talking about health and so yeah. forth, about the degree to which I think many people have found that laughter does indeed uh, help us not only to cope, but oftentimes to overcome as well. So we need to add that with our six to eight glasses of water a day. We need to add that to our 150 minutes at least, of at exercise. Least 10, at least 10 good laughs a day. 10 good laughs. We need to add that, uh, sisters. And I, and I think we also need to have more Black doctors and more Black nurse practitioners, more Black social workers, more Black psychiatrists um, who will be able to serve our community and our needs um, and who will take us seriously. I agree, I agree. All right, Mrs. Dance, we're ready. We're ready for you to talk about um, the next question. How can we learn from stories from the past in order to heal in the present? Well, stories from the past, proverbs from the past, history from the past, all help to prepare us for the present day. And if we don't learn a little something about what has happened in our past, then we're not able or ready to deal with issues today. It's really interesting to me, every day I turn on the news and I look at the awful things that are happening and right away my mind goes back to some tales, some proverbs, some events in the past. And nothing much has changed. Mm. That's really, um, really sort of the sad uh, point of, uh, of this. But um, um, let, let, me just, let me just read an introduction 
to okay. uh, Honey Hush, which I think says something to the point that you're talking about. If there is any one thing that has brought African-American women whole through the horrors of the Middle Passage, slavery, Jim Crow, Aunt Jemima, the welfare system, integration, it is our humor. If there is any one thing that has helped us to survive the broken promises that have been our lot in this nation, it is our humor. Humor for us hasn't been so much the cute, the whimsical, and the delightfully funny. Humor for us has rather been a means of surviving as we struggle. We haven't been laughing so much because things tickle us. We laugh as the old blues line declares to keep from crying. We laugh to keep from dying. We laugh to keep from killing. We laugh to hide our pain, to walk gently around the wound too painful to actually touch. We laugh to shield our shame. We use our humor to speak the unspeakable, to mask the attack, to get a tricky uh, subject on the table, to warn of lines not to be crossed, to strike out at enemies in the hateful acts of friends and family, to compliment, to berate. We use our humor to brag, to flirt, to speculate, to gossip, to educate, to correct the lies people tell on us. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we recognize, as Toni Morrison has written in jazz, that laughter is serious, more complicated, more serious than tears. Um, wow. Just wanted to share that with you because the, the one thing is that laughter has been a healing balm through the years. And when I get together with my friends and we talk about Trump and we talk about some of the things we're seeing daily, we are almost ready to cry until somebody has a good tale or a good joke uh, or something that helps to relieve some of that tension and to get us through the day. Wow, I think you just took us into the next question because uh, the next question was, does humor help or hurt? And, and I had written something about current events, including, you know, the police killings, um, benefits of humor in a crisis. Um, and I think you've even answered that, like another part of the question, is it an opportunity to acknowledge, satirize, and subvert stereotypes? Is there a potential decrease uh, in anxiety stemming from um, these social and economic inequalities with humor? And I think you probably have addressed all of that. Unless, Daryl Lynn, did you hear something? Well, that I can pack up and go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not it. Daryl Lynn, did you hear something that maybe we um, didn't expound upon? Well, um, I just want to say music can also. Ah, OK. You know, and music, is, music consists of a story, right? Um, yeah. Stories told through song. And a lot of times musicians will remake a song or they'll take a song and um, especially hip hop artists, they'll take a song and remix it, um, repurpose it and um, recreate it. So songs have a, a very healing purpose. And I know for me, as we're going through these trying times, music has been a bomb for me. I've been enjoying and have been getting through, you know, this time listening to Beyonce's Black Parade, listening to hers, I Can't Breathe, listening to Run the Jewels, listening to Rage Against the Machine. Um, so, you know, music is also a bomb as well, so. Um, don't downplay that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need to upplay that because that is so true. Uh, uh, whether like you, you listen, you listed a lot of genres um, because then I go into, you know, there's the, you know, the gospel music, contemporary, this, there's jazz. You're, you're right there. And we contributed to all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it is uh, we originated, right? Yes. Is that? All these aspects of their culture work together and are not disconnected and single, but they're a part of a whole of the things that have brought us through. 
you know, they tell the tales and, and, and the slave stories tell these tales over and over and over again. On that Sunday when some of them had time off or late at night after their work was over, they found somewhere to get together. And they told their stories, they sang their songs, they danced. Yes. All of this is a part of it. And, and believe me, a part of that folk culture is not just singing, dancing, but it's eating. And they got yes. together and they laughed about the chicken they had stole from old master's farm mm. <laughs> and cooked up for them. Uh, so, so many aspects of our culture from Africa through the slave period to the very day are still a part of how we deal with those stresses you started out talking about and um, how we feel good. Because believe me, and, and when they tell these stories about uh, getting together at night and celebrating, it is so interesting. Sometimes it lasted through the night. Sometimes it was so loud they put the pot down because they thought that that would help to keep the noise from coming through and old massa wouldn't hear them. Wow. Um, and the singing, the dancing, and so forth, it was their reprieve. And even if they weren't alone, they sang songs in such a way that the master didn't know what they were singing about. They told stories in such a way that the master thought they were just talking about the animals when they were indeed talking about them. So in so many ways, they have found ways to um, uh, survive all those stresses. I come back to that. Hmm. So, so the, the songs and the music were, you know, were used as our sort of code talking and so Absolutely. I mean, we, we're, we're experts at the codes and I mean, even the codes were emblazoned in our quilts and in our artwork. Uh, and uh -huh. art is so another, many, another. So many ways. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. So I had down here, um, what does self-care look like for you? And I think Daryl N started out by talking about music and what she's been doing, um, doing all of this, the civil unrest and COVID-19. Uh, Ms. Dance, what, what have you been doing, um, uh, you know, as far as self-care uh, during this time? Um, you know, I don't always think of it in terms of health care, uh, but no, I guess self, we, self. Might, we might speak of it um, uh, in that way. I um, try to get out for a walk every day. I don't walk as much as I should or as much as I would like to. I try to read every day. I often don't read as much. <laughs> as I thought I would be reading when I had all of, uh, all of the spare time. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think for me, the greatest reprieve has been calling and chatting with friends and laughing with friends, um, exchanging. I mean, I have friends who send me pieces on email, uh, funny pieces, music, just a wonderful thought. Um, and then really it's family that's, that's the basic backup, um, getting together uh, with my um, children. Alan sometimes comes to go for a walk with me. Daryl Lynn comes occasionally for, to spend the night. Um, and of course, I hear from Taddy and Warren all the time. Uh, I'm speaking as if I'm just talking to you guys and there are other people out there as well, but I'm referring to my children uh, here. So family has uh, been a big part. Um, and then, as I said, uh, reading, uh, I just love humor. Humor is a salvation for me. And um, I pick up Honey Hush and read some story I had forgotten about or some tale I had forgotten about. And, and, or sometimes just the pleasure of reading the tale and remembering the situation in which the tale was given to me, remembering right. the character of the person who told me about the tale. It's a whole putting that all together. together. I think it's a lot of reminiscing on my part as well, I'm thinking as we talk now. You know, and I was thinking about that as Daryl Lynn was talking about the songs and how the rappers have uh, uh, repurposed some of the songs or re-engineered. 
and I would hear those songs and it would take me back to a place in time. Yes. Reminiscing. So that's one of the things I had written down for myself. Um, reminiscing, um, feel with a lot of gratitude uh, about what is. And you were speaking about your family and I want to bring Daryl Lynn in here because I really have a question for you, Daryl Lynn. Growing up in a household with your mother and all her friends and colleagues, these literary experts, uh, I wanted you to kind of give us a feel for how was it growing up with these uh, quote unquote literary aunties and, you know, poets, writers and, you know, I don't know, give, give, me, give us your perspective. Well, growing up with literary aunties, you have um, a lot of encouragement. Um, there's a lot of uh, creativity that's around you. And um, there's a network of people who help you with your own work. So um, I've been working on my own writing. And so I just, I read the, my writing to them and then they give me critiques and <laughs> um, it can be a little intimidating sometimes. <laughs> uh, but um, one of the things that you realize is that, um, you know, we're all human beings and um, th they are also women who play cards, they you know, exercise, they um, love to um, get together and, um, you know, just kind of cook and, and enjoy life. Um, so it, it's, it's not just always um, writing, 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 but... Uh, well, I Nikki would say, you're not gonna talk about the cooking? I did <laughs> talk about the cooking. And she oh, said I the cooking. That. Yeah. talk about the cooking. And how the food is a, a social <laughs> gathering for us. Kitchens are a place that we typically like to gather and to socialize. So I'm so excited to get other people engaged. I know we've been doing a lot of talking. I really want to hear, and I know people have to go because it's near the top of the hour. And um, Sierra, can you, if you don't mind, yeah. uh, dances, can we get some um, comments? Or if you want to open up Sierra and let people ask their own, yeah. let's do however you want to do the Q&A. Yeah, that's you want to hear? answer. Um, so we have a question from Annie Green over at George Mason University. Um, going back to when we were talking about how music is also a form of healing for us, um, she asked, she asked, yes, the stories and music are wonderful, but what happens when the dissonance stops the voice of the storyteller and the music? What happens when what? The dissonance stops the voice of the storyteller and the music. Hmm. <laughs> So is that kind of, so I want to start off, is that kind of like the conversation, Sierra, we've had in the past with some of your music, I would say, I don't like the lyrics. And you would say, and this is when you were a teenager, you would say, it's the beat. I'm not listening to the lyrics. So is that the dissonance they're talking about? Mm -hmm. Or um, because I feel like I can't enjoy the music without both. Um, uh, tuning into both the, hey, the lyrics. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you wanna speak. Hi. Yeah, hi. by dissonance, I mean, um, uh, unfortunately, sometimes we mask how we feel. So if we're laughing, but we don't feel that way, it may make you feel better, but that only lasts for a certain time and period. So at a point, it doesn't work anymore. And even though the music and the stories and everything are wonderful, uh, the behavior is that we're laughing to keep from crying. Mrs. Dance referred to that. So you feel like that that momentarily momentary break uh, is, and I would like to hear what you guys, what the dancers have to say. Let, let, me, mm -hmm. let me just say, um, and I'm not so sure that I'm getting exactly to the point that she is making, but actually the, the music achieves its own end if it serves our means. Let me just give you one example, an old slave song. 
if I could sing, it would be wonderful. So I'll just recite it because I can't <laughs> sing. Listen to this. I got shoes, you got shoes, all of God's children got shoes. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes, gonna walk all over God's heaven. Heaven, heaven. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. I'm gonna walk all over God's heaven. Now, I don't care what anybody has to say about that or anything. That slave had made her point. Mm. Everybody talk about heaven ain't going there. She's saying something to the master who is putting on a front of being such a Christian. Mm. She putting on her shoes. She says something to the master who may not give her any shoes. He's got his shoes. When she ends with, I'm going to walk all over God's heaven, she's saying something to them. Now, they can tell her, get the heck out of here, go back to work, whatever she wants to. The point I am making is that so often through our music and through our tales, we achieved a kind of release and relief within ourselves. Did it cure everything? Did it free us completely from slavery, not exactly, but it freed us from some of the issues that we have to deal with in times like that. And I think um, stories and, and, and music and so forth continue to uh, serve that purpose through our history. Um, and true, we get up in the morning and when the sun rises, it's still the same day. But I wish I could remember exact, exactly what um, the Haitian writer Dantica uh, says. So I'm just gonna try to paraphrase a little bit. She talked about going down to Haiti with the awful catastrophe that they had. And just everywhere she went, there was destruction and so forth. And she said at night, they would sit around and joke because at least the the darkness had covered the end of that horrible day and they didn't yet have to face what the sun would bring the next morning. And so, yes, the answers may not all be complete. The questions may not all be, the problems may not all be solved. But uh, if, if you have time to sit down with a good book of black folklore, of black songs and so forth, you will find ways in which these songs served a very real purpose, even though the sun rises the next morning and sometimes things haven't changed. Oh, I think that was an awesome answer. I think you covered it. Um, what came to mind as you were speaking, Ms. Dance, was self-empowerment. Yes. If it does no more than that yes. for yes. that moment, sometimes that's all we need. That's at right. that moment in time. Yes. And I know, Daryl Lynn, you wanted to say something and I, I cut <laughs> in. <laughs> no, I was just saying that um, songs and books and stories serve as a form of catharsis. And, um, you know, sometimes it's not going to last forever, right? Our emotions go up and down, you know, depending on um, the day of the week and, and, and what we're going through. So, it's, it's just, it, it can be just a release, something that we just need to let out. And sometimes, you know, I listen to music and I cry because I need to let that out. That doesn't mean that I'm gonna cry every time I hear a song, but sometimes I just need to let out that emotion because certain songs just make me cry, you know, so. That was great. Sierra, are there any other questions? Um, let's see. Yes, I have one from um, Carmeletta Williams. Um, she's asking, isn't momentary relief valuable? If you can de-stress for a moment, forget your problem for a minute, or the time it takes to listen to a song, that eases your spirit. Hasn't it served its purpose? That's the question. You can always do it again, but don't miss the moment because you fear it's only going to be temporary relief. Yes. I agree. I agree. I, agree. I know that was, a, that was kind of a question and statement. Comment, comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we awesome. all agree. Awesome. Any more questions? I kind of had a question. I mean, 
Okay. Momentary okay. relief is valuable, but how do you have relief that's more sustained? Would you repeat? Um, I was saying, like what Carmela Carmeletta just stated, momentary relief is very valuable, but how can we have relief that is sustained um, past the moment? Or into how can we incorporate that in a deeper way into our lives? Well, there's no question that I think we have to work towards ways uh, to do that. Uh, let, let's just look at what's going on right now. People might say, what, what good is this walking out in the street? What good is what you're doing now? Well, for one thing, there is a sense, I'm sure, that the people who are out there are feeling that they are at least addressing the problem, mm -hmm. that they're making their points, that they're saying something to somebody, um, um, that in so many ways, they are releasing the anger, the pain, and the bitterness. Mm -hmm. um, and when I said so many ways, I thought about what the mayor of DC did when she wrote Black, <laughs> Black Lives Matter on the street so Trump could see it every time he looked out there. Is that going to completely solve it? I don't know. But I think a lot of us got a lot of pleasure in just envisioning what he was thinking and what he was feeling as he looked at that message out there and saw a street renamed right then and there. My son is messing with me. How does he keep coming on here? Um, <laughs> Hi, Alan. We see you. <laughs> I'm just sitting here. You guys, you're my witness. <laughs> but I will say now that I have the microphone, I will okay. say that don't discount momentary relief because sustained relief begins with momentary relief. So you're not going to get sustained relief if you ignore the opp opportunities for momentary relief. Hmm. And you see as a mother mm -hmm. that there's no end. <laughs> to, uh, to this, I forgot what I was trying to say, but but a part of the point I'm I was me. Is this: every step, <laughs> every step leads to another step. I think that's we really have saying. to laugh about things, and that helps us to analyze them. That helps us to figure it out, you know. And we come down with some kind of of plan for tomorrow. And it doesn't mean that we're just going through life laughing all the time. A lot of this is not so much laughter. Some of it is satire. Some of it is sarcasm. Some of it is a number of different forms of humor. Hmm. Uh, but uh, a part of the point I was making is that what's going on out there in the street is so much like what has gone on from save rebellions through issues with segregation, through issues with reconstruction, through issues with all of the problems in our society, what is going on there. And none of them had a quick reaction, response, solution. But I think certainly some things are going to grow out of what is happening with this movement that we are witnessing every day on our televisions. Uh, already we've seen uh, some laws changed, already we've seen uh, some differences that are being made in some police departments. I'm not saying that it has been solved because every day we see something that's going on in our government and in our police departments that suggests this problem is worse than most of us, even those of us who are pessimists. It's worse than most of us envisioned that it was, but we're taking some steps. I talk about humor a lot. I talk about humor all the time, some might say. And uh, I think it is a critical point. Uh, but I talk also about all the other things we have to do as we are planning ways to uh, improve our lives and our situations in this country. Uh, and, and the main thing is we never stop planning. <laughs> we never stop uh, working on it. We never that stop is true. That is true. I see a couple of comments um, like from Vicki Hughes. Uh, she said, writing your thoughts down on paper helps. Um, and then uh, from Carolyn Blunt, she said that humor helps uh, relieve our anger, which is not good for the heart. So there's uh, another, uh, I guess we can add that to humor and, and release of anger. Uh, so what we should do on a daily basis, those 10 laughs. And uh, uh, I think that's all good. Sierra, do you see any other 
uh, questions or comments or um, that's in the chat box? If I could. Um, I don't, oh, go ahead, Darlene. One, if I could jump in one time. If you feel like um, you are going through depression because you're not having a kind of sustained, um, if, you, if you're having sustained helplessness and you feel like you're going through depression, you do need to go seek help. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, and I would encourage you to go see your general practitioner or your internist who can um, you know, help you find a psychiatrist or a psychologist or social worker who can help you. So if you feel like you are having, um, if, you're, if, if you're having a sustained helplessness, then, then go ahead and seek help. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to add, um, you know, it's very hard to talk to someone face to face. Um, there's a great app that I have used personally called Talkspace. Um, I believe it's about $12, $15 a month. It's usually therapy. Um, it's either it's a very long waiting list um, mm -hmm. or it's very expensive. Um, but Talkspace is a very um, affordable choice. You can FaceTime or you can just text or chat with a therapist. They have thousands of online therapists if you're not um, necessarily ready because um, it can be very difficult, especially when you're first getting into it. So I just wanted to offer that resource to you all. And what Helene started with, I think is really very important to go for a walk, go for a run, go for a swim, uh, get on your bike, uh, work some of it out that way as well. And something that I like as we started, and I guess we're coming to the end, is meditation. Um, sitting there, being silent, being still, um, yes. listening to your heartbeat, um, defocusing. Uh, I, I feel like, and I, I meditate, so I, I'm a proponent uh, of that. And, um, you know, you talked about the walking and, and yoga, Pilates, and a prayer. Uh, yes, and prayer. Uh, oh my gosh, we didn't talk about the spiritual influence, mm -hmm. but I could be on here all day talking about that. <laughs> about that um spiritually but that's really important i think that's that that intersection though with meditation and karma and universality and spirituality i think that's all wrapped up into that together um so that is great so we i think we we started with stress we supposed to end with de-stressing right <laughs> um are there any last minute questions or comments um before I let Sierra take us home. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to read any of my favorite uh, stories, but we'll do that next time. <laughs> oh yeah, so there will be a next time. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. this is, um, I said in the beginning, but this is our first ever live stream. It's our first ever Conscious Conversations live stream. Um, I think it's been incredibly successful. And um, I would really enjoy uh, to hear the feedback uh, from this and so that we can build upon, so we can have something sustainable going forward that meets your needs as Black women. I really would love to hear more readings uh, from Ms. Dance. I, I, it's incredible. Uh, her writings, I really would love to just maybe have a moment that we can do that uh, in the thank future. You, thank you. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, you both, especially Sierra, for planning this. It was a wonderful event. I want to thank the people who came on. I look forward to seeing your comments. A few of them have popped up here. Um, and I'm sure um, it will mean so much to all of us who are participating. And remember, she who laughs, laughs. Laughs. All right. Okay, Daryl Lynn, how can you top that? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I think she just closed us out. One more question. Yeah, I think she closed us out, Daryl Lynn. I don't know. Um, okay. Do you have time for one more question? Oh, yeah. Do you have time, Daryl? Daryl Lynn? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, this is from Amelia Bedrine. 
How can the youth evolve to become the best version of ourselves? I didn't young hear women? You. How can the the youth evolve? The what? How can the youth, young women, evolve into the best versions of themselves? Ooh, hmm. Question. I'm gonna let somebody else deal with it. I didn't. <laughs> well, well Daryl Lynn, you know, works with students a, a lot as you were talking about how you shift the conversations from the grades and, and perfectionist uh, attitudes. I think Daryl Lynn, may, because of her experience, uh, and, and I know Amelia, grad student, so I don't know, Daryl, Daryl Lynn, I'm putting you on the spot, but I think you may be able to answer that for us. Well, I think that um, the youth have to be passionate about what they want to do as opposed to what society tells them to do. Um, they have to think about what they enjoy, what they like to do, and pursue that as, as their goal. Um, and I think um, the youth should um, also laugh 10 times a day. <laughs> should also, you know, eat right, exercise daily. Because, <laughs> um, you know, they think they're invincible. That's why a lot of them don't wear the mask. But anyway, that's another conversation for another day. That's right. Wear the wearing the mask. Wear your mask. <laughs> Um, um, enjoy life um, and um, you know do the best you can but don't punish yourself if you fail just learn from um, the situation you know so that's kind of my starting point okay. oh, I love it I think that's the beginning and the end because I can relate to a lot of what you just said, um, if I can summarize one or a couple of things that stood out to me was do what you feel and not what society uh, expects of you. When people look at my LinkedIn profile, they're like, she's all over the place. You know, she she was an optometrist, health equity uh, director, uh, FDA, corporate, uh, private practice, corporate pra practice. But, you know, because I think if you look at that, that's a person that, A, have passions and interests, and those passions and interests drive, was driving her career-wise, but I also want to add to what Darlene was talking about, but personally as well. Mm -hmm. um, so be the best you you can be, but be true to you. And I think we aren't taught that. Uh, a lot, and I and I can speak personally for myself that when I was younger, let's say 30s, early in my career, I decided to be what society wanted me to be: um, was the the doctor, uh, the mother, uh, the way that society want me to be that mother. And it took growth and experiences to get to where I am now. And if I had to say something to my younger me, always try to dig deep and look inside, look at what truly makes you happy. And if you can't have it all right now, have a little of that. Just don't lose yourself and become what society thinks you should be. Uh, I think that was great, Daryl Lynn, and gave me an opportunity to share um, a little bit about me and how that's so, so important. That's so important. If we have another second, I have a little tale this reminds me of. May I share it? Yes, we're ready. Okay. In, in, in African-American culture and African culture as well, there are so many tales about what parents want their children to be. And there's a wonderful short story from the Harlem Renaissance um, where this aunt who raised her nephew said to him, you know, be a doctor and cure people. If you can't be a doctor and cure people, well, be a minister and save souls. And if you can't be a minister and save souls, well, be an undertaker and bury people. But the fact is you're doing something, <laughs> something for people. And I laugh about so many of these stories, but just this weekend, just this weekend, I had such a great laugh with Daryl Lynn watching a comic from Nigeria whose name is Yvonne. Yvonne? <laughs> Talking about what her parents mm -hmm. 
And is yeah, that is that right? What her parent Yvonne Orgy? Yeah, okay. she's an insecure, right? What her parents <laughs> anticipated for her. So if you want to have a great laugh about this subject, go hear her. Go hear her. <laughs> Well, I think that is great. Go laugh. I think that's the overall theme. Uh, we're going to practice those, get those 10 laughs in per day. And yeah. until next time, Sierra. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, again, for joining. I think this has been a wonderful space. I feel a little more healed than I did before. So that's mm -hmm. a start. <laughs> um, and I would just like to close with um, a few mantras um, so we can leave this space um, feeling empowered. Um, you can re either repeat after me or you can repeat them in your head or if you have your own mantras in mind, you can repeat those as well. I know I am loved and supported as I move through the day. I surrender my worries to the universe. I choose to feel good about myself every day. I am exactly where I need to be. I release my past and forgive myself Everything I need to heal is already within me. Things are always working out in my favor. I'm effortlessly creating a life I love. The next step is always being revealed to me. I use love to make all the decisions in my life. Beautiful. Thank Beautiful. You. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Great job, Sarah. Thank you. Let's <laughs> <Nice> take care. <laughs>